get my deviation variable for the first x in the first column, the deviation for the second variable x2 in the second column of capital matrix x. Y variable is also written in the deviation form. We noticed last class that the first and second variable are inversely correlated. So when one goes up, the other goes down. Also, we noticed last class that the first variable is positively correlated with y. So they go up and down together. And the second variable is negatively correlated with y. Again, they have an inverse relationship. I'd ask you to, to look at the x transpose x matrix and interpret these values over here. Any, any interpretation for that value 55.5 in the first entry? How about you? How might you consider that that value? Um, correlation of x1 with itself? Other suggestions? Correlations are between zero and one, uh, between minus one and plus one. So it's not quite right, but you're on the right track. It's the covariance that scaled by n. So in other words, it's the variance of x with itself multiplied by n. This entry 2, 2 entry is the covariance of x2 with itself multiplied by n. So your diagonal entries in x will always be positive. They're variances of the variables with themselves. So diagonal entries will always be positive in the x transpose x matrix. The off-diagonal entries will always be symmetrical. In this case, we only have one off-diagonal element, so minus 57 is in common. And it's the covariance of x1 with x2. The negative sign emphasizes what we noticed yesterday, and that's this inverse relationship between x1 and x2. So the negative sign clearly points out there's a negative correlation, or negative covariance, if you want to say that more accurately, between x1 and x2. We say that x1 and x2 are negatively correlated. It's just a perfectly acceptable way of saying that. So, what I'd like to do then is just talk a little bit more about the x transpose x matrix. It's a scaled version of the variance covariance matrix. That's a common terminology that we call x transpose x the variance covariance matrix. Variance referring to the diagonal element, covariance to the diagonals. And what would x transpose x look like if, this, if these variables we were using were totally unrelated to each other? x transpose x gave a special structure in that case when my x variables are unrelated to each other. What would the walk diagonals be for unrelated variables? Close to zero or identically equal to zero if they're perfectly uncorrelated. So we will see this in the design experiment section. In the, when we do experiments, we intentionally do our experiments so that we have unrelated variables. So we'll get this very special structure in our x transpose x matrix where my off diagonals are zero. Yesterday's class, we said that to calculate our model coefficients, we need to calculate our model coefficients B is x transpose x, this is this variance covariance matrix. If we take the inverse of it, multiplied by x transpose y. x transpose y is simply the variant is, is the covariance of x with y. So that's this little guy over here, x transpose y. It's the covariance of each x variable with y, one at a time. Covariance of x1 with y, the second entry is covariance of x2 with y. So that's that second part over here, this covariance matrix of x with y. The first part is the variance covariance matrix. But we take the inverse of it. How, what do you, how can you numerically take the inverse of the matrix? How do you do it if you're faced with doing that? Right now, if you had to do it for a system with, say, three or four variables, you don't do this by hand. You use the computer to do it, for sure. So we'll use MATLAB or R to do this inverse for us. But if x transpose x is the special structure where we only have entries on the diagonal and our off diagonals are zero, we can actually calculate x transpose x inverse by hand. Okay, so we call this from the linear algebra course, if x transpose x has only entries on the diagonal and all your off diagonals are zero, you can invert that matrix by hand. 
I see students in the exams calculate x transpose x inverse by hand when there's zeros on the off diagonals using Gauss reduction and all sorts of crazy things using up 20 minutes of their time. And how can you do it? No, 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 not if you've got off diagonals to zero. That's so here, if your x transpose x matrix is say 42 and this is 67, the zeros on your off diagonals and x transpose x inverse is equal to 1 over 42, 0, 0, 1 over 67. No need to do anything special, okay? This is why we teach you many algebra. <laughs> okay, so, so please remember that. Do not waste your time in testing exams. Punching in x transpose x and trying to get it on your graphing and then doing it by hand. Okay, we, for these special cases where there's zeros on the off diagonals, we can do it quickly. If there's non-zeros on the off diagonal, you must use software or a, a long <coughs> Let's take a look at how you would solve this problem in R. In R, you would simply say, build me the linear model of Y predicted by X1 and X2. So nothing special here. You simply add in this extra term that you um, now augmenting your model. So if we take a look at this in R, you would specify X, X1, X2, and Y. So that's done up here. This code is posted on the website, so don't copy it down. There's my raw data. I've shown some code here below that. If you really want to go ahead and do this by hand, you can go create deviation variables. So x1 raw minus the mean. x2 raw minus the mean of x2. And there's the deviation variable for y. If I want to create this x matrix, capital X, which is the first column of x combined with the second column of x. So in other words, I want to create this guy over here. Use the cbind command. C bind stands for column bind. It will bind the first variable to the second variable column wise. So put them two columns side by side and create that two x. If I want to calculate x transpose x, use the T operator. T in brackets x will transpose x. Matrix multiplication in R needs to be distinguished from regular multiplication. And the way you do that is in R you use your multiplication symbol surrounded by percentage signs on either side. That will tell R, don't do regular multiplication of element by element multiplication. Do the regular, uh, do the definition of matrix multiplication. So percentages on either side. So XTX here will get me my X transpose X. XTY, X transpose Y. If I want to invert the matrix, there's this interesting function in R called solve. Solve x transpose x will invert it. Take a look at the course website's R tutorial for the reason why that function is called solve. There's a little, little bit more detail there to that. But that will give you the inverse of x transpose x. Now I've got everything to calculate my model coefficients. x transpose x inverse matrix multiplication x transpose y. Never forget that formula. x transpose x inverse x transpose y comes up all the time. The product of the variance covariance matrix inverted with the covariance of x and y. So that's if you want to do this, if you want to do all the work by hand, you can certainly go ahead and do that. And R will calculate the model coefficients there for you. E is, the first coefficient is 1, the second coefficient, slope coefficient is 0.42. We're going to talk about how to interpret that in a minute. But like I said, you can do all this far more easily in R. R will do all the work for you based on the raw data. You don't need to go create deviation variables for R. Simply give R the raw data for Y and say, tilde, describe my Y by x1 plus x2, and then take a summary of the model. Just take a look at that output. Exactly what you would expect. There's my slope coefficients. 1.09 for the first x variable, my slope coefficient for the second x variable, 0.42. I get all my usual output, the residuals written up here. I get my standard error, 1.27. I get my r squared, 0.83. Nothing's different. Okay. So you get, you get everything you need in the regular way. So you'll need this for the next assignment that's due on Friday. There's one question that asks you to build a 
multiple linear regression model. That's exactly how you go ahead and work. Any questions on, on that R code? So if then you get stuck with R, um, I'm sending you a code and I can figure out where the code is. Okay, so let's take a look at next to how to interpret those coefficients. If we go uh, to the course notes here, uh, by the way, I'll leave this slide for 600 level students to self-study. <laughs> find your raw data and center the whole matrix if you want, or you can uh, center them separately and then see the line of the deviation. So you don't have to the same one. Let's figure out now how to interpret these coefficients. I'll start geometrically first and then we'll look at it algebraically. So one way to visualize the system is to, on a three-dimensional axis, recognize I have x1 and x2 as my, as my input variables. Notice I don't use this terminology of independent. So here's my input variables x1 and x2, and my output variable y. So we're in a three-dimensional space now, where everything is going to move to higher dimensions. We've gone from 2D for a long time, let's kick it up to 3D now. My least squares model now is not a straight line, it's now a plane. That's the plane shown by in blue. My data points lie above and below the plane and sometimes coincidentally on the plane. The least squares objective function is to minimize the sum of squares of these residual heights, or these distances. So the least squares model is no different to before, still minimizing the sum of squares of residuals to the model plane. This time the model is a plane, it's not a line. And if you go to three x variables, x1, x2, x3, and you have your y, you're in four dimensional space, it's still a plane. You just can't visualize it so easily. Or at all. So some of the squares of the residual heights are the deviations from the data point to the plane. My prediction, y hat, is that plane itself. What is the slope coefficient? I'm saying in my model y is equal to v1 times x plus v2 times x2. So if you recall from your math courses or analytical geometry courses, those are simply the slopes of each individual variable. So v1 is the slope of x1, v2 is the slope of x2. We need to interpret them though in a very specific way. So let's take a look at this example. Coefficient V1 is the average change we expect to see in Y for a one unit change in X1. But here's the important part that you must never forget. Why did we hold the other X's fixed? So in this case, I only have one other X, X2. So my slope coefficient V1 is the expected change I see in Y for a one unit change in X1, provided I hold all my other X's constant. We must recall, we must always remember to add this extra phrase in. It's no different to before other than that part that's in bold over there. So if I use this example here where Y is my yield from a bioreactive microgram, the, uh, the Vt sub, uh, e subscript T is the effective temperature. V subscript S or Vs, and you'll see a lot of Vs coming up because I seem to use this S coefficient a lot, so let's get it out of our system. You see this all in the DOE slides. Vs subscript S multiplied by S, the substrate effect. So numerically, if I use R, I get negative 0.5 times temperature plus 3.2 times substrate. Bt's coefficient is interpreted as a minus 0.5 microgram decrease in yield for every one Kelvin increase in temperature, providing we hold the substrate concentration. The 3.2 coefficient is the increase in yield we expect to see for every one gram per liter increase in substrate concentration provided we hold the temperature. It just makes our life a lot easier for interpretation. 
we always look for multiple linear regression set our intercept to zero by creating deviation variables. We can always recover our intercept. And our, if you use our software, it will give you the intercept. In fact, if you go look back down here, notice our will calculate the intercept for you anyway. So, but for ease of computation, we create deviation variables. Your slopes that you calculate will still be the same value. So whether you center or don't center, you'll always get the same variable slope value. So it's just easier from a computational point of view to, to force your intercept to be zero. Now, if you read the literature, especially for those of you that read uh, medical literature or the pharmaceutical literature, pharmacokinetics, you will often see this terminology, the effect of controlling. So it's identical. Let's say, for example, my confidence interval for Bt spans zero. So the temperature effect, Bt, has a confidence interval that includes zero. You might see this sort of terminal, this phrase in, in a journal publication. The effect of temperature controlling for concentration is not significant. So controlling for that part here simply means we've included that variable in the model. So you've included this control for variable, in other words, concentration in the model, and you've determined that while controlling for concentration or accounting for concentration, your effect of temperature is not significant. That's all it means. Or let's take an example where my confidence interval perhaps for the substrate, Bs, may not, might not span zero. So let's assume it does not span zero. You might read something in the literature. The effect of concentration control for temperature is to increase the yield by 3.2 micrograms for every gram of increase in concentration. Okay, so controlling for simply means that you've happened to be, you've happened to include that variable in the model that you've controlled for. So you might, might see controlling for concentration and something else and something else. You'll see this a lot also in the sociology literature. So they say the effect of one's uh, performance in university controlling for background education, parents, wealth, and so forth is not significant. So they, they control for a variety of effects, means that they've included those in their model, and despite those effects, the variable is significant or not. Okay, so, so it's just good, good to be aware of it because many of you may end up working in fields where that's a common way of stating it. It simply means that you've added it to your model. Now let's take a look at, at something that's a little bit more interesting and, and we're going to use this heavily in the DOE section. When we look at design experiments, many of you have already started to think about your project and have identified what are binary variables. So some of you are looking at paper towel brand A versus brand B, or the popcorn example we discussed last time was using oil or butter, for example, might be a binary variable. Let's take a look at this example, where someone in a lab has figured out that the temperature affects the yield from the bioreactor, but also the impeller type seems to have an effect on the yield. And the impeller that they've chosen is either a radial or an axial impeller. Now, two variables, temperature and impeller type. You collect a lot of data on both reactors, with both, uh, sorry, with both impellers, I should say. So you collect a lot of data at different temperatures in the first reactor, and you collect the data at a whole lot of temperatures with the second impeller. You could go build a model for each impeller type. You could build a model using this variability in temperature on the one impeller, and then another model with the variability for the, for the axial impeller. Now, you use the same material in the, the binary reactor. So you would expect then that the effect of temperature should be identical in both reactors. Right? So if temperature increases the yield by three units per degree Celsius increase, you should see that in both reactors if the temperature effect is independent of the impeller. But by doing that, you're not making efficient use of the data. I've got to collect a whole lot of data here and a whole lot of data here the degrees of freedom I have available to myself get reduced because I'm, I'm essentially splitting my data set in half, building two separate models. And guaranteed, the temperature variable I will get in this model 
the temperature slope coefficient of given second model will not be identical. Okay, so then you're going to sit back and like, well, why not? So what we'd like to do is when we're faced with binary variables, is we would like to be able to include them in the model so that we don't have this inefficiency taking place. And we're going to see now how to do that. So let's take, a, take that bioreactor example and extend it out and say, well, y is equal to some intercept. Okay, so I'm going to include an intercept here for discussion purposes. When you calculate the model, you'll simply drop those out to zero by creating deviation variables. So here's my intercept plus the effect of temperature. Temperature is a slope coefficient we call beta 1. Let's call the population effect of the impeller type gamma. So beta 1 is the population slope coefficient for temperature. We don't know that. <coughs> gamma is the effect of the impeller type. Again, we don't know gamma. Let's write that as our theoretical model. The line below that is the model I'm actually going to estimate. And we're going to code this variable d. We're going to code it. When you use that terminology, it just means I'm going to choose as my notation. So coding simply means I'm going to choose as my notation that when I set d equal to 0, that will represent the axial impeller, and d equal to 1 will represent the radial impeller. So I'm just using this binary coding, and that's very standard, 0, 4, or 1. So let me assume for now that temperature has no effect. I'll cut, we'll come back and bring temperature back into play in a minute. Let's assume that beta 1 is 0. So my model essentially is this model that's down here. y is equal to b0 plus g, the effect of the impeller, multiplied by di. And di is 0 for the axial cases. And for the data points where I did my experiment in the, with the radial impeller, di will equal 1. So I simply code my model at, at those two levels. Or if I simplify that, all my data points for the axial case will be y is equal to b0 plus a 0. And the data points for, from the radial impeller is y is equal to b0 plus this g. So geometrically, let's take a look at the geometric case. My first experiment was done with the axial impeller. So my x-axis is simply the order that I do my experiments in. First experiment is done with the axial impeller. Second experiment on the radial impeller. Axial, radial, axial, radial, axial, axial, radial, radial, and so forth. So I collect, I do my experiments in, the, in that particular order, and at the end of the experiment, I measure my yield y. And that's what's coded on this axis. And I notice that I plot my data up like that, that the experiments done the axial in, with the axial impeller lead to lower yields, the radial impeller leads to higher yields, for whatever reason. Maybe the axial impeller shears the material open for us and we get a lower yield in that yield batch. So I notice this consistent offset. And on average, that offset between these cases down here and the cases up there, the average offset is G units. So I experience an offset of G units. That's the difference I would expect in yield when changing from radial to axial. This is critical, this interpretation of G. Slope coefficients for integer variables are always the change going from one case to the other case. Very, very critical. When you interpret slope coefficients for continuous variables, like temperature, they're related to a one degree increase in temperature or a one degree change in whatever variable. When we're dealing with binary variables, the interpretation is very specific and very, very important to, to take care of. It is the change when I go from the axial case to the radial case. And that may, that's made clear by this geometric illustration up at the top. It's the amount of increase in yield I expect to see when I go from this condition, axial, to that condition, which is radial is G units of increase. So now, let's, now that we've got G cleared up in the interpretation of what the impeller effect is, let's bring this temperature term back into play. The 
temperature term which we had initially dropped out, so let's bring it in as base B1, and let's assume that, that that is significant, so we cannot set that to zero. If we go back to our analytical geometry courses, if we try to visualize that, what happens is those are the, just the equations of two lines that are parallel to each other, offset by a constant amount g. If we had to visualize it in three dimensions, you would see something along these lines. So now notice what's happened to my axes. Here's my x1 axis. It's the effect of temperature. It's a continuous variable. It smoothly varies from low temperature to high temperature. But this d axis is the effect of impeller. It's going into the page. It is the effect of the impeller type. And it's only valid at two discrete points, at the zero point, at the closer towards you, and at the one point further away from you. So the radial data lie further into the page, and the axial data lie into the front of the page, because I've chosen to code them zero and one. It is still a plane. That plane still exists. It's still defined from a purely analytical point of view, from a pure equation point of view. That plane is still defined at all points of D, not just the integer values of 0 and 1. We will only use the model, however, at the 0 and at the 1. But at all points in between, it's still perfectly valid. It just doesn't make any sense to interpret it at those points. But it does exist at those intermediate points. And the slope coefficient, the steepness of the plane with respect to the d dimension, that has the coefficient of g. If we go back here to the previous slide, g is the slope coefficient with respect to that d axis. Let's say g was this number minus 56. So I know my illustration shows a positive slope, but let's assume that g for some reason was a negative value. G equal to minus 56, you would interpret that as, written up here, the decrease in yield is expected to be 56 micrograms when changing from an axial to a radial. From the case where D is coded as 0 to the case where D is coded as 1. If I flip my D's definition around and I choose to code axial as 1 and radial as, as 0, this will just simply change sign. Your interpretation will remain identical. You will always get the same interpretation. So your choice of coding makes no difference. Okay, so whether you choose to code male or female as 0, 1, or vice versa, that would work fine in the model. If you choose to code high school students, university students as 1 or 0, it doesn't matter what your choice of coding is. All that will happen is, depending on your choice, if one person chooses one form of coding and another person flips that choice around, their signs will just flip. But your interpretation of that will always be consistent. Okay, so that's, that is an important part here, and, and why integer variables work so well in these, in these models. So let's take a final look then at integer variables now, if they vary at more than one level. This might be an example where uh, this was inspired from an actual case where when I was working with a pharmaceutical company, these weren't the countries, we were dealing with data from other countries. But let's say I have raw material that's available from three suppliers, supplier A, B, and C. Or for convenience, let's call it Spain, India, and Vietnam. I would like to know what is the effect on the yield depending on where my raw material comes from. This is good to understand because obviously we'd like to choose the supplier that gives us a higher value for our yield. And that's what the slope coefficients are going to tell me. But how do we interpret the slope coefficients in this case? Well, it depends totally on how we code them. So let's choose arbitrarily, I've chosen the zero for D1 and zero for D2 to correspond to Spain. I choose D1 equal to 1 and D2 equal to 0 for India, and then I flip that around for the final case. 0 over here for Vietnam and a 1 over there. So I can put that into my, into my software. I will get two slope coefficients, gamma 1 or gamma 2. 
And the interpretation then of gamma 1 is the increase or decrease in yield, depending on the sign of that estimated coefficient, would be the increase or decrease in yield when changing supplies from Spain to India is the effect of D1. So if gamma here was plus 5, it says that you get a 5% increase in yield, or a 5 unit increase in yield, if you change supplies from Spain to India. If I got a value here of minus 10, it says for D2 slope coefficient, it says your decrease in yield is 10 units if you change supplies from Spain to Vietnam. That's all the all, all slope coefficient tells you. So it's always relative to a baseline. That's the key, the key part here. One thing you, you might be tempted to do is you say, well, this is really messy to interpret. I would actually like to tell my boss, you know, this is the effect of just Spain, or just Vietnam, or just India. Okay, it's kind of cumbersome to talk about this is the effect when changing from something to something else. It's a bit tedious to talk like that. Or your boss is going to say, well, I don't want to know what the difference between Spain to India. I just want to know what Spain's effect is. Well, you may be tempted to go ahead and encode one for Spain, one for India, and one for Vietnam, and set them to zeros at, at the other conditions. So you've now added three integer variables to your model. Code a one here, a one zero zero corresponds to Spain, a zero one zero corresponds to India, and a zero zero one corresponds to Vietnam. You can certainly do that. You can write up that x transpose x matrix, but you will not be able to invert it. And so as a result, you cannot go ahead and actually calculate any slope coefficients because V equals x transpose x inverse, this guy over here, will just be a matrix of nands. You won't be able to do any calculations. Okay, and that's because you've created three perfectly co-related variables or correlated variables, and you cannot actually invert x transpose x in that case. So we always, this is the general rule. If I, if I have an integer variable that I need to include, raw material supply, for example, and it has, let's say it has A levels, so A levels, so in this case A is equal to 3. There's Spain, there's India and Vietnam are 3 levels. I need to use A minus 1 integer variables. So if this particular variable had four unique values that it could take on, I would need to include three integer variables into my model. So that rule always holds. You may be tempted to include capital A in your variables, but you will then not be able to convert your Okay, so that's the Interpreting these integer variables is something we're going to gain a lot of practice with over the next few classes when we get into design experiments. As I've mentioned, many of our experimental practices will be integer in nature. Integer in nature. So you're going to be able to get very comfortable with this sort of interpretation coming up. I do want to stress here that interpreting the confidence intervals on integer variables is no different to regular continuous variables. So in this case, let me say my gamma, for example, might have a confidence interval that spans zero in this case. It just simply says that integer variable has no significant effect on the So there's no, no difference in interpretation on the confidence intervals or the slope coefficients. Um, just be careful when you interpret the slope coefficient. It's the change from one case where you coded it as zero to the case where you coded it as one. So there, I think in the assignment there, there is a, a question on uh, whether there's baffles or not in the in the reactor. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's a this is a perfect example of that sort of thing. Any questions on on this topic? Okay, good question. So does R automatically assign yeses and noes to, to the variable? 
in R, when you put that variable in, you need to create it as a factor variable. And when it reads it in the data table and it says C battles yes and no's, it will try to create a factor variable. So R, that read.csv function has a lot of intelligence supposedly behind it. It sometimes works in your favor and sometimes it doesn't. But if you read in a, ver a variable and it's got text in it, so R can't create numbers from this, R automatically assumes this is a factor variable. And it sees a yes and it sees a no. So what R will do is we'll go through that column and find the number of unique entries that appear. And if there's a yes and a no, there's two unique entries. So it will create a factor variable at two levels, yes and no. Then when you put that factor variable into R, into building a linear model, you would do something along the lines of, you'd say y is equal to, down here, x, let's say that was your regular continuous variable, x1, and x2 was a factor variable. R recognizes it's a factor variable, does all the conversion internally behind the scenes of creating the binary variables for you, and the output summarized here is in the same form. Okay, so R, this is why I like R a lot, because it, it takes care of these details for you. As good software should, it doesn't force you to think on the technicality behind the scenes. It takes care of those details for you, allowing you to just get on with your work. Which really, ultimately, what you want is that output from software. Another question? I don't know. When you're interpreting them, do you need to know which one? Are one yeah. So yeah. So unfortunately, I don't have a factor variable here to, to do it with, um, and I don't have any internet connection right now to download it. So what I'll do is, um, it's in the in the tutorial. It, it talks about using integer variables in R, but I will also post an example on the part of the website related to this class today under, under the resource section where I demonstrate. Um, so, what I thought I'd just quickly talk about, maybe this will be a little bit of a rush. Um, topics I have remaining in the slides, this one is probably the most useful one too. So near the end of your slides, there's several extra pages. So for example, all this material on leverage, discrepancy, and influence, this is all for interest. This is not part of the curriculum. Um, it is just if I have time and I normally do cover this. Unfortunately, the snow day that we had a few weeks ago is pushing me back in, in my planning. So this gets bumped, unfortunately. It is valuable if you wish to read it on your own. But there's this one enrichment topic that says we have a few minutes left, I think will benefit us from, will benefit a lot. So one question that often comes up is how to judge a model, how to test it on totally new data. And this is an important question because we've built a linear model, let's say y is equal to b0 plus b1x, 1 plus b2x2. Let's say we've got a two-variable model. One thing that we're often interested in is judging the prediction ability of this model on new data. How can we judge whether this model is any good? And here's a really good tool to, or some really good guidance to, to bear in mind. Always use an independent testing data set. Okay, so if you do this, and you only do this to judge your model, you'd be doing a lot better than pretty much most engineers do. I see this in companies too often is that they take the data they build the model from and they use that same data set to test the model and make judgments on how the model will perform. You're really just, all you're doing there is lying to yourself. You're taking your own data set and, and using it to tell you how good your predictions are. Well, of course they're going to be good because the objective function of that least squares model was to minimize the residuals on that data set. Okay, so of course it's going to be good predictions. But the key way of testing a model is to keep a some fraction of your data set aside and use it to test in the future. A good rule of thumb, 60-40 split. Use 60% of your data to build the model, keep 40% aside to test it in the future. 
Well, when I say test, what are you testing? How are you judging the ability of that model? You can't use R squared. R squared is a number that's due to the model itself, due to the data itself. You can't calculate R squared on testing data, on fresh data sets. But what you can do is you can calculate the mean square error. So on your testing data, on the new data, RMSEP is the root mean squares error of prediction. So root mean squared error of prediction. And it does exactly what that said. Calculate the error of prediction. You work backwards with this acronym. So maybe let's just put it up here so we've got it all down. So RMSEP is the root mean square error of prediction. So do this first part, calculate the error of prediction. Why new? So the new emphasizes that this is testing data that you've never used before. New data where you actually know the y value. This is the 40% that you set aside, so you know what y is. Subtract it from the y that you predict from the model. So y hat is the prediction from the model. Calculate the prediction error. So that's this portion here. Square it. So take the square. Calculate the mean of that. So square it, sum it. The mean is to take the sum and divide by n. So this sigma divided by n is doing exactly this mean step. So I've calculated the errors, squared them, calculate the average of the squared errors, and then take the square root of that. So simply work backwards in that. This will give you a single number that is a good judge of the model's prediction ability. Take a careful look at that equation. What does it remind you of? Standard deviation, standard error, standard error. Standard error. It's very close to the standard error. Standard error divides by n minus k. K is typically 2, 3, but n is usually a big number. So dividing by n or n minus k is not a big difference. This is very close to the standard error. So it's a great way to judge the model's ability on fresh data. If you get a number here for RMSEP that's pretty close to the standard error, you've done a good job of your building your model. It means that you're getting prediction errors that are comparable to the errors that you got when you built the model. Okay. So this is really, really key, is to make sure your RMSEP is close to your standard error. Now what is RMSEE? It's the root mean squared error of estimation. So it's the root mean squared error, not of prediction, but of estimation. And we simply use that to emphasize that the RMSCE is different from the RMSCE because the RMSCE is calculated on the data you use to build the model. So you really you're not predicting that data. And again, here RMSCE numerically if you compare the equation for RMSCE and standard error, they're pretty much identical. So if my RMSEP, root mean squared error prediction, is close to the standard error, I've done a fantastic job with my model. That's the only way to judge a model prediction ability in a fair manner. It's firstly on testing data that's never seen before, and secondly to use a metric that you then can compare to some baseline. And a good baseline to use is the standard error. So we're going to see a lot more of these squares inside the ERA section. We're going to get very comfortable with the